Hey everyone. So um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether you like what will actually come up, but if everyone could just write hi in their chat box, just to let me know that you're there and that you can hear me and everything's going well. Um, and, uh, and I want this to be a Q&A. So uh, what, what it'll actually be is um, a situation in which at any time, if you feel like you need to ask a question about what I'm talking about, please write it down and we'll go to it immediately. We'll try and deal with it that, that particular time. We just want to make sure that, um, that we're actually giving you the information that you want. I did uh, put out a questionnaire beforehand and we got a little bit of information back, which is perfect. But um, who I am is uh, I'm actually considered a body manipulation expert. So most people sort of hire me as a gun for hire. I did work with Art Smith. Latrice, are you still there and still able to talk at this time? Yes. So uh, Art Smith, if th those of you who don't know, is like a, a celebrity chef, but he has a massive link with Common Threads. He's, he's still part of the organization, is that right? That's correct, he's our co-founder. Yeah, so co-founder, um, and I worked with him for an extensive period of time. Um, we actually lived together uh, when he was starting his health and fitness expert, but um, uh, health and fitness regime. So I sort of, uh, I worked with him, but I mainly work with athletes and celebrities. Um, I've been contracted to work with Will Smith for the probably the last seven years. I haven't actually worked with Will for about a year now, for, but for the last seven years in between that coming up to the last year, I worked exclusively with him, exclusively with him um, and his family. Um, and that was again in body manipulation. So what we were you know, doing is essentially designing a physique uh, for his particular character. And I would write the program that he would implement or I would actually help him implement that. And we would try to manipulate his physique to match, you know, what it is that he needed as far as that character is concerned. So the first thing that um, that I really want to talk about is is actually the the lockdown. And I don't want to talk about it in terms of the virus. I just want to talk about it in terms of our own perception of the lockdown and then our own actions around the lockdown. So what I noticed over the weekend is. Um, Nobody's in lockdown. It's, it's done for people. Uh, I'm in LA, uh, in more specifically, I'm in Venice or just out of Venice. And so the beaches were packed, uh, people are walking around, a few people have masks on, but essentially like the lockdown for them is, is done. And I think that this is a major situation around understanding your own personal mind is how it is that you're interacting with the lockdown. Most people, when they come into it, they go, look, it's really strict. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna see anyone. I'm not gonna abide by you know, anyone else's rules. I'm gonna have my own rules and this is what I'm gonna do. And then after a week, then they start to ease that. So they start to go off and they start to do other things. Meaning like, well, now I've got, now I've got to go to get food, so it's okay, and the times, you know, when I need to go to the grocery store or I need to go and do something that I need to get done, then I'm happy to come in contact with people, but I'm still going to like, in, you know, implement the social distancing. And then another week goes by and they start to ease those restrictions that they've placed on themselves. And another week goes by and essentially like they get to a point where they're like, I'm done. I'm done with it. I'm going to go and start seeing my friends. I'm going to go to the beach in public spaces. I don't, I don't really mind. And I don't care about how it is that you take on this lockdown. I have no personal opinion on it. Um, I have my own rules that I'll abide by. But what it is, is this is just understanding the human mind. And in, in specifically your mind and how you interact with the decisions that you actually make. So there's actually, there's been there's been an app that was developed a long time ago. I don't know if it's in circulation anymore, but it was, it was a car app. And basically what it was, it was a personality test. So you would fill out this questionnaire. It was multiple choice. You would go through it. I don't know how many questions it was, between 20 to 50. Um, and is like essentially based on the information that you filled out, it would spit out the perfect car for 
your personality. Based on your personality, this is the perfect car for you. Most people, they didn't like the car that was actually being spat out in terms of their personality. So they would go back and they would change the answers until they got the car that they wanted. And so what, what you really get from this is, it's like we make these decisions whether consciously or subconsciously, and then we go back and we fill in the reasons for those decisions after we've already made the decision. A lot of the times we feel like we're actually com computing the reasons why we're making the decision um, as we're going forward before we've actually made it, but subliminally we've already made that decision. We know the way that we're gonna go and we're just filling in the reasons. And what this all relates to is you've got to be really, really careful around your mind. When it comes to health and fitness, the first thing that you've got to deal with is the systems that are going on in here. Because like what will actually happen is you'll set up your, your platform, you'll set up your, your system, you'll set up your program, you'll set up your food plan, you'll set up whatever it is that you believe that you need to get going. And you'll do it for a particular period of time but then it starts to fade. Then we start to get ourselves in a situation where we start to do other things. We start to ease off. We start to ease the restrictions around our food plan. We start to justify it by, well, look, you only live once. I want to have a greater balance. I want to do this. I want to do that. And you've really got to understand the way in which you work. And then when you can understand the way in which you work and the way in which you think, then you can start to really set up your program. So the, the situation that we actually had with Art was he was actually 324 pounds uh, at the time that we started working together, which is hugely obese. Um, he was really struggling. Um, and he, he doesn't mind talking about it because he's not in that position anymore. But I worked with him for an extensive period of time in setting him up and educating him as much as I can and implementing it. So we did it together. Um, and he ended up losing about 120 pounds. So he came in at like 204, I think at his lowest at one stage. Um, extremely fit, we ran a couple of marathons. I think he did two marathons in the space of about three weeks, which isn't overly healthy, but he overcommitted and wanted to abide by his word. So um, it was all fantastic and he got himself in, in great shape, but he started to get uh, a public perception of him that changed. So, you know, there was a show that he was doing that didn't like the fact that he lost a lot of weight. They wanted him to be an overweight chef. It fit in more with the demographic that was actually viewing. Um, and there was a lot of sort of external influences that came around it and himself and the way in which he actually was, you know, thinking and functioning. And so he started to put on the weight again. And it started to increase and increase and increase. Now, it never got back to the state that he was in previously because he's been educated to a greater degree, but he did put on a substantial amount of weight. I, I'm happy to say that he's back on the path um, and just signed up to do another marathon next year if you want to join him. I think he's doing the Disney marathon. So really, you've got to work with your mind as the first thing and you've got to understand yourself and you've got to be brutally honest unless we're like 100% honest about what it is that we think and the way in which we function. And you can speak to like your five closest friends. They'll tell you um, if you are happy to receive that information from them. Most of us go into a state where we're colluding. It's like, I won't call you on your stuff if you don't call me on mine. In this situation, if you are genuinely committed to making or obtaining a result, then you're going to have to really look at the systems that go on in here. So that comes to the next part, and that is just in terms of where you're actually receiving your information from. And here's the thing, do not trust anyone. So I would even say even the concepts that I talk about, do not take it gospel as gospel from me. Go out, have a look, see if you can find independent peer-reviewed um, papers that have been written on the subject as opposed to believing anyone. Everyone is selling something, whether it's an image, whether it's um, a product, everyone is selling something and you've got to be really wary about that because their intention is not about you and your health. It's about giving you some result to actually obtain something else. 
And also we start to use that, like the, the decisions that we make around where we're going to collect our information from based on the decision that we've already made around health and fitness. If we have the, the idea that it's just going to be too much, um, it's going to be too hard, I'm not prepared to make that commitment, I don't want that imbalance in my life, then we will start to collect information that supports that decision. So just be really, really careful. Again, don't take my word as gospel. Make sure you go out and have a look at, at any information that you can get. Please look for peer-reviewed scientific studies as opposed to a glorified personal trainer who's going to tell you the information, which is me. So when we actually get started on our health and fitness program, obviously we're going to break it down into a few areas. The first area that we break it down in, into is food. Um, we have to have a food plan. Then we've got exercise. Then we've got supplementation. But the most important is actually the measurement. So I did get um, a Q&A and I asked people what it is that they're really trying to do. Um, and a lot of people said, um, I'm looking to gain muscle. Other people said, I'm looking to lose a little bit of weight. Other people said, um, I want to be fit and healthy. And, and these are all great goals. They're all goals that we need to have included in any health and, and fitness program. But at the same time, what it is, is we need a system for measuring the progress, for measuring the results. I did have a situation with a client, um, a high profile client who had a lot of people working for her. And we went away and she wanted to do a cleanse. So I, I didn't recommend it. It was for an extended period of time. I believe it was three to four weeks. Um, she, she specifically uh, wanted to do it to lose weight. Um, and I told her that that was the wrong way to go, but I was supporter her in the decision that I would come out and do it with her. Uh, and, um, and we went and we did this. Um, she, she actually said, you know, she wants to lose weight. And then when I said it's not the right way to go, she changed her mind and said, no, no, it's more about just, you know, cleaning up and restarting and, and getting, you know, set to, to continue on this new, new lifestyle. Um, and after about three weeks, she'd lost about 10 to 12 pounds, which is a good result. It's a really good result. Not, not overly healthily done um, from my perspective. Uh, and then we spent another 10 days after we were in a remote location. We spent another 10 days after we'd actually done the cleanse. Um, and you go back to normal eating. So the cleanse basically consisted of um, psyllium husks and benzonite clay and um, an electrolyte drink. So it was nothing more than that. Uh, I think we were doing coffee enemas. Um, so you were doing two enemas a day. Um, and, and just this drink. Uh, so it creates a, a little bit of an imbalance in your system, um, but basically there's no food. There's no food, minimal fluid, just the ones that's sort of moving through your body. But um, she went from this point of losing 12 pounds and moved into a state where she needed to start eating again and your body's now craving nutrients because it's been deprived for so long. Um, and she went to the point where she just continued to eat and eat normally. Um, and we got back to um, her house or her location. And the people that are around her, she has a lot of people that works for her, um, basically said, you look amazing, you look incredible. Um, this is fantastic, your skin's so you know, glowing um, and you've lost so much weight. And she was over the moon until I asked her to step on the scale. And she's like, no, I don't wanna do it. Um, and I really forced her to, to do that. Uh, and I know that there's some people who don't, you know, um, don't want to have that system, but I forced her to do it because we needed to actually be accurate with our results. It turns out that she'd actually, during that period of time, I think it was a four week period by the time we got back or just over, she, she lost three pounds. It was so upsetting to her that that was the actual result that, that she asked me to pack my bags to leave. And I was like, cool. Um, so I started pack my bags and leave and one of her workers came in and said, hey, listen, is there another way that we could actually, you know, do it, set it up? And, and I said, no, no, there's not. She needs to like understand that her actions are producing this result. And unless we are actually having that feedback, then we don't know what the result is because the perception that was coming from her and the perception that was coming from others 
is that she'd lost a considerable amount of weight and she looked fantastic. So the person went back, um, the lady came in, she said I, she apologised and she wanted to you know, continue to work, but at the same time, then she was really angry with the people that were reflecting this opinion. And the reason that I actually tell the story is because the most important thing that you want to have set up in the first place is your measurement systems. You want to know what result that your actions are actually producing. Most people don't want to know that in any, any particular area. I don't know how to know that in my relationship. So if I'm acting in this particular way, then the feedback that I'm getting is instantaneous. But you don't want to actually have to deal with that. So the measurement system is more important than anything, but it is like on top of that, you've got to understand what it is that you're actually measuring. Scale weight is one of the things that we need to measure. Like we need to have that as a measurement, but it's only one part of it. And the reason that we do that is, it's going to give us a guideline. So for the people that don't want to use scale weight, there is another way, but the scale is going to be super important as, as one of our measurements that we're going to do on a regular basis, just because of simplicity and ease. The other thing that like you need to sort of know about scale weight is when people say, Hey, I want to lose three pounds. Most of the times I say, well, look, just go to the toilet. And although like we, we see that as a ridiculous situation. Let's say they've just gone to do a pee. So they go to the toilet, they come back, we can measure their scale weight. The scale weight's actually changed. You can change a pound. Um, and we go, well, yeah, well, look, we know what that is. But the reality is if I put you on a diet where it was a low carb diet, so we completely eradicated complex carbohydrates, your body would start to excrete water. So what that means is any time that you, like when you're consuming complex carbohydrates, our bodies need more water to be able to digest that. So if you think about it in terms of something like pizza, with that dough, so if you've ever mixed dough with water and you see the substance that it becomes, it becomes like this kind of gluggy substance. You can imagine for that to pass through your, into your bloodstream, you have to dilute that down. So you've got to continue to drink water and drink fluid, drink fluid, drink fluid until we get to a point in which that fluid can actually pass through into the bloodstream. It can go through the digestive system. So you've got to be continuing to drink water. And there's a lot of times where you will have something like a pizza and you'll feel continually thirsty and you can never quite quench that thirst. That is part of the, like what is actually going on. So if you completely eradicate all carbs, then our body doesn't need as much water within the system because it's not needing to digest our foods. So now we, we have actually, at the end of the week, we've lost five pounds and we jump on the scale and we, we're down five pounds and you think, fantastic, carbohydrates are, are the devil. And all we needed to do was cut our carbohydrates and we lose all this weight. But all you've actually lost is water weight during that particular time. You could have gone up in actual body mass but your water weight has actually gone down. So what system do you need to implement that is actually gonna go in turn with the scale weight that's gonna tell you the result or actually gonna give you the focus that you need, really need to focus on? And the other thing, well, the other part of that is, is specifically body fat. We need to be measuring body fat because it's the only thing in your system that you don't actually really need. So, Essentially, all body fat is is stored energy. We've consumed energy. We've taken in more than we actually need at that time. The most efficient way to store it is through fat because fat is actually calorie dense. So it turns into fat in our system and we store it as energy for the time in which we'll actually need to use it. So any time that we're consuming more calories than we actually need, then our body is turning it into fat and it's actually storing in our systems. So this stored energy, it's, it's not really needed in terms of we, we know where our next meals are coming from. We don't need to be like that. We're not going to like be in a system or be in a, in a way of life where we're only getting a meal once every three days and we need to eat like a camel in which we'll store all this food and then use it over that particular time. So um, there is a certain amount of body fat that I do need to say, like I need to tell you guys that, that, that is essential that we need to have. Um, it's really important that we do have it within our systems. 
Uh, I think for guys, it's around 6%. Once you start to drop under that, you'll, you'll start to, um, it, it's actually a little bit lower, but I won't train a woman under uh, 14%. So women will carry uh, on average 6% more than a guy. Um, so it, it, most women, if they're 14% body fat, they'll be like over the moon. It is um, an incredible shape. But if you drop under about 12% for, for, for women, 12% body fat, they'll start to run into complications around their menstruation. Um, and that means it won't exist. Um, there isn't enough uh, fat within their system to be able to support that. And a lot of athletes, um, anyone who's super skinny um, and starts to drop under that particular level, uh, have completely eradicated their, their menstruation, which isn't overly healthy from my perspective. It can be done for a period of time if you are an athlete and you need to, you need to focus on that and that's what you've chosen, but it's not particularly healthy and not something that I would actually suggest. But how do we measure our body fat? So there's so many different ways you can actually do it. And even to the point where they have these $8,000 machines that I've seen it at some gyms where you'll hold uh, electrical impedance, um, you'll stand on it barefoot, you'll have your hands, and basically it runs a current through your hand, down one side of the body, through to the leg. It does the same on the other side. And um, based on that current and the time measured from getting from one point to the other, they can give you a guesstimate as far as your body fat is concerned. Um, not accurate. It's not accurate in terms of uh, what is a conductor. So I've actually said to them, I will debunk this. And they're like, it can't be done. Got a body fat test at the start of a workout, went in my workout, drank up to about two liters of water, which is a lot of water during that time. Knew it was a conductor, stood it on again. My body fat percentage changed by a couple of percent. We need to be more accurate than a couple of percent. So the most accurate systems that you can get are... Um, you can go on a dunk test, which is like submersion. So you're going underneath water. There's a scale underneath water that you actually um, sit on and they measure you, but you've got to get all the air out of your system. And there's a thing called a DEXA scan, which is almost like an MRI scan, which is probably the gold standard, but it's not practical. These things cost a couple of hundred dollars. They're only at um, medical facilities or institutions like um, universities, you know, sporting teams will probably have it, but it does measure, you know, your complete body. Um, but the thing that we'll probably need to focus on is that you want to get a body fat caliper. These things cost about five bucks. You can get them on Amazon. They're not overly accurate in terms of the number that it will give you, but what they are accurate in is that it will give you a reference point. So what I mean is it might say that your body fat is 20%. Um, and that might be inaccurate. Your body fat might be 12, it might be 25. But what it'll do is it'll give us a consistent reading as we go from moving forward. So, you know, we know if we go down to 19.5%, it'll give us a consistent reading in terms of the device. So normally what you'll do is it's just a simple pinch. It'll pinch a area of fat on your body. It's normally the superiliac, which is just above the hip bone. It's a one site thing. Um, so because it's only one side on the body, everyone's body fat is actually distributed differently, um, but we measure one particular site and it'll just give you a reference point. Your body fat goes down, it will go down in that area. Um, so you can, if you wanna get like a little bit more tricky, you can open up a couple of areas. You can do an area on your thigh. You just wanna do areas in which you can actually do yourself um, because this is something that you wanna do and it's something that you'll wanna do on a weekly basis. You want to know the program that you're putting into place is producing a result. What result is, is it producing? I've jumped on the scale weight. There's a way to do it, jumping on the scale weight is. You want to get something that's super accurate, um, digital, ideally. And what it is, is you're jumping on it first thing in the morning. You get up, go to the toilet, jump on the scale naked. Get up, go to the toilet, jump on the scale naked. You want to have a look at that number. Then on a weekly basis, you want to do your body fat. So you'll do a pinch, it'll be on your body, you'll know where it is. You wanna do it exactly in the same place every, every time. Look for markers on your body so you can like get it exact. And these two numbers will actually give you the results of what your program is actually producing. Unless you have that in place and you're doing it by line of sight, like oh, I look better or I feel better or whatever it is, you won't actually know. We, we need to get it down to the point where we're, working on you know 
0.3% of body fat per, per week. I have scalpers that cost calipers that cost $350. They're medical grade, and I wouldn't suggest anyone do that. Um, the, the simple $5 ones are good enough for one area. They will give you an accurate result in comparison to the results that you're producing or in comparison to the test that you're doing over time, as opposed to the number that you plug in to the algorithm to give your overall number. Is everyone following me at the moment? Just if you can type in, just say yes. If there's any questions, throw it up and I will, um, I'll answer them. But we need to get started on that program. So just remember, you've got to have your measurement system in the place. If you don't have that measurement system in the place, it doesn't matter what program you're actually following uh, unless you know the intricate details of what it's actually producing. Super important. So then we break our program down as far as body manipulation is concerned into three distinct areas. Like I mentioned before, we've got our food, we've got our exercise, and then we've got our supplementation. Supplementation, um, I won't go into today, just because it's more about, you wanna take a multivitamin as a backup plan. Um, there are certain supplements that you can take that are gonna help you as far as your training is concerned, but you'll need to do more research on it. Um, there's only about 10 supplements that are actually circling around in the bodybuilding world that have had enough scientific study to consider that they actually work. And they're things like protein powder. We know it works. Um, when we get into stuff like nitric oxide, all these other things, and, and look, these bodybuilders go into incredibly unhealthy versions that they're prepared to take as far as their physique is concerned. Um, I wouldn't even consider talking about them because they're not part of my world. Um, and like, the, so supplementation is something that can actually aid you, but you've got to have these other elements in place. For me, um, I'm going to talk about exercise specifically first, and then we'll go into a little bit about food if we have the time. So exercise, I sort of break it up into two parts. We've got the resistance training and the cardio training. And I think that you do have to separate them. Um, I like to separate my resistance training into body parts as well. Uh, there's seven different body parts. And so they are broken down into the bigger ones, which are your chest and your back, and obviously your legs. Then the smaller ones, we've got our shoulders, our abs, and then the arms, which are the biceps and triceps. These are the seven areas that I'd actually break it down to. The reason I break it down to them is because I normally devote one day to each body part. The way in which you break it down, so, the way in which you, what the reason in which you do that is essentially what you're doing when you go to the gym and you're doing resistance training is you're trying to break down the muscle. So you're injuring it to a minimal degree. It's tearing muscle fibers. So you're overloading your muscles to the point where they're actually breaking down. The reason that we do that is, is because we go away and recover and we're building it back and it's building back stronger that is muscle growth that's actually what's actually occurring so that's why i break it down into these body parts now you can start to add them um, you know to do a push day which is chest triceps and shoulders and a pull day which is back and biceps because you're using similar muscles just to limit the amount of days and and if you're first starting up that's what i ideally i would do and the reason i do that is because to break those muscles down you don't need to do too much in the beginning. For me, I only devote about 25 minutes to each body part. That's all I'll do one week. Um, but also that gap in between, so there's a week gap in between from say, let's do chest. So there's a week gap. The reason is because you need to let it rest and recover. If you try to work on a muscle that hasn't been fully recovered, you'll impede your growth. You'll still grow, it just won't be as efficient. It's not gonna be as, as long. So what, what we tend to do is like, you can actually change your cycle. So you're doing it every five days, that would be the most aggressive. And you can actually make it longer, like every 10 days. It's just up to you how you want to set that up. 20 to 25 minutes is all you'll actually need on one body part. It will be enough to overload that muscle. When we're talking about overloading a muscle, you'll only ever want to do it about 10% of where you're currently at. So it doesn't matter if you have the strength to go well past 10%, you only ever want to do about 10%. And it's super important at this particular time because about 10%, it will affect our immune system minimally, but it will actually give it a boost when you come out of it. So what we're looking to do is 
hit that muscle or hit that area, hit that grouping, then let it rest and recover, then come back and do the same again and just continue that process. So the rest and recover, it's about drinking water, it's about sleeping well, it's about getting the right nutrition. So now that we've like broken down those seven areas, then we can set up our program. So there's lots of different programs and it will all, they're all online and it will all come down to what's actually occurring for you. So whether or not you are got access to a gym, you, you probably don't at the moment, none of us really do. Um, there's programs that you can actually do at home, which I guarantee you will create a adaptation for you. You can do this with body weight. There are times where that is all I've actually had is just body weight. I remember going, traveling for six weeks in India when I was younger and all I did was push-ups and, and sit-ups. And I did them every second day, push-ups one day, sit-ups the next day. I did it for six weeks. After the end of the six weeks, I met up with a friend of mine who I was traveling with previously and he couldn't believe the adaptation that had actually taken place. Now, it wasn't overly healthy and it certainly wasn't um, beneficial the way I was doing. It was just what I knew at that particular time, but it did create a massive adaptation. You can do it from home. Um, it's easy enough to do. There are so many programs online. You can check them out. I think that there's a guy called Jeff Cavalier who has a YouTube channel. Um, he has lots and lots of stuff. He's excellent. Um, you'll have to sift through because he's also running an entertainment channel, which is a YouTube channel. So you've got to sort of sift through some stuff, but you'll find his programs for at home. That they're, they're, they're good because he, he focuses on the technical side of things. Um, so just they're the sort of like the basics for it. So we've got our measuring system. We know our body parts. We're going to break them down. You've got to work on your cardio as well. I, I work on it separately. A lot of people tend to incorporate both of them. I think when you incorporate both of them, um, you do a poor job of isolating the one thing. So your fitness levels do improve, but not to the degree if you actually separated. Your strength or your muscle mass will improve, but not to the degree if you've, again, separated it. So the amount of time that I would devote to cardio, uh, minimally about 20 minutes, maximally about 30. Um, it depends on what what it is that you're training for. I did an Ironman last year and it was up to six hours a day of just cardio. Um, I think we, we at the peak were doing 20 hours a week, which averaged to be about three hours of cardio today. I would never suggest that. It took me a long, long time to fully recover. Um, but I, I would definitely implement 20 minutes minimally. And so what that means is raising your heart rate up to a good solid level and keeping it there consistently. So if that for you is a good, strong power walk, good. If that means you've got to get on the treadmill and run at 10 miles an hour, then that's what you need to do. So again, with those, I would never suggest anyone go into the red zone. I don't, this is about doing hip training. This is about getting a decent calorie burn in as included in improving your fitness levels. What you always want to focus on is creating a sustainable lifestyle. If you are not prepared to do 30 minutes of cardio, then do 20. If you're not prepared to do 20, then 10 is better than none. It's just, again, when we come back to the human mind, your mind of what it is that you're prepared to do and what it is that you are prepared to sustain over a longer period of time. You have to set this up predominantly as a lifestyle. You can move in and out of like super strict into easing it for this period of time, going into a maintenance mode and then coming back. But you want to know what it is that you are specifically up for. What are the decisions that you're actually making in your head? Will you be able to sustain this for a long period of time? If I say to you, do 20 minutes of cardio, 20 minutes of resistance training a day, and you won't do it, then good. That's a great thing that you know that. Then you've got to figure out exactly what it is that you can do. And then you've got to have a look for a program. I wish I could help you, like, you know, looking for those programs or even developing those programs um, to, to to match your mindset and what it is that you're prepared to do. So once you've actually got your resistance and you've got your cardio in place, then we're actually looking for the body manipulation. The body manipulation comes through, through nutrition. So what it is, is we're talking about it in terms of energy, consuming energy. So I can have two people training exactly the same way and one gets big and, and like muscular and the other gets super lean and they're both training exactly the same program. And that's because we've actually changed the building blocks that are going in their system. So what I mean by building blocks is the nutrition that you're actually putting it in. 
I just want to talk about nutrition just, <laughs> this is coming through common threads, which is all about food. Um, but they do talk about food as medicine. And really, really it is. Like during this particular time, we should all be like studying nutrition. Uh, the YouTube, sorry, somebody's just put up a question saying the YouTube's personality name. His name is Jeff Cavalier. I think that his channel is called Athlean X. Watch out. They do have a lot of programs, but he's got a lot of free information. Free information. He does a lot of technical stuff as well, which is super important. You want to know what you're doing is actually like you're doing it the right way. So that's why I think he's excellent. Um, highly accredited. He's worked with a lot of athletes uh, and I, I think he's excellent. Um, but I also think that he's selling products. So you've got to sift through like getting, you know, a solid product or a solid um, program without like having to buy into all the upsell. Um, so now that we're looking at body manipulation, we're, we're actually consuming energy. So you think about like every single piece of food has an energy value. They consider that a calorie here in this country and the rest of the world, they consider the kilojoule, same thing. They're all just units of energy. And what um, a calorie is, is the amount of energy it takes to heat one liter of water, one degree Celsius. So that means nothing, just understanding it in terms of like, it's an energy management, um, it's an energy measurement system. So when we consume foods, it's actually there's chemical reactions going, occurring within our system and it's giving off heat and we're measuring that heat. So when we measure that heat, we can measure it like in a form that we can actually start to use to be able to incorporate in a program and it's just a calorie. So every food has a calorie value, um, but it depends on the amount of food that you're actually consuming. So I had a friend that was eating all organic, um, super healthy and she come to me and saying, why am I 20 pounds overweight? And I'm like, because the amount that you're actually consuming is more than what your body needs. So we need to understand energy value. We need to understand the energy value of foods because the thing with manipulation, body manipulation, it is all about the amount that you burn and the amount that you consume. A lot of people like have tried to debunk this and say, no, you've got to count your, your carbohydrates or you've got to count just your protein or you've got to count this. It is all about energy value first and foremost. There are other things that you need to take into account down the track. So all you've got to understand is if you want to lose weight, you need to be in a calorie deficit. Have to. You've got to burn more energy than you're actually consumed. If you want to put on some muscle mass or put on some weight, you've actually got to consume more calories than you're trying to burn. There's ways in which like, you, you need to manipulate that to start to work the physique. The one thing that I do need to say about that is that you need to, again, have measuring systems for both. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say you need to count your calories as far as your food is concerned, but you need to understand roundabout. You need to understand roundabout where you're at. So the, the way in which you measure your burn, there used to be metabolizers that were on the market. They were medical grade metabolizers. They were fantastic, super accurate. You wore them on your arm. They were a little bit like the body bug that Biggest Loser had. I don't know whether you guys have ever seen that. Um, and they give you a lot of information. Um, now they don't have that anymore. I think that company was bought by Jawbone. I don't even know if Jawbone is around, but I don't know, like they bought the technology. They tried to incorporate it in a wristband, it didn't work. But essentially uh, I, I wear a Fitbit at the moment just because I have a few friends that wear a Fitbit. And so we can like keep each other accountable by being on the app and sort of having a look, but it will do a calorie burn on it. It's not overly accurate. I've tried to eat exactly the amount of calories that it said I was burning previously um, with the algorithm that used and I started to lose weight. And I started to lose weight like at a good point. So I knew that I could eat the amount of calories that it was saying I was burning and it was keeping within a small deficit. And that's another point that I really wanna make for everyone here. You need to, to actually lose body fat, you need to be in a small deficit. You cannot like try to lose weight too quickly. And that's why all of these programs lose 20 pounds in three weeks. They are not going to lose your body fat. Your body will go into a starvation mode. It's called, um, it will start to retain the body fat. It believes that your body is in some kind of a trauma. It starts to get rid of other things that can be water. It can be bone. It can be muscle mass. Your body will look for nutrients wherever it can find them. 
So you've got to make sure that your deficit is small enough that it will actually start to use body fat and only body fat. So that means coming, sitting between a range of 500 to 800 calories. You could probably go up to 1,000, 500 to 1,000 calories less. That's the range that you've got to sit in. To do that, you've got to know how many calories that you're actually burning. The measuring systems, again, you can get like a Fitbit. There is other devices as well. I believe the Apple Watch does it, as long as it's something that can do 24 seven. Because the amount of information that it'll give you is, is so important. So what it is, is like you, there was times working with art in which we went for a two hour run and then we just relaxed for the rest of the day. The next day he was cooking in the kitchen for six to eight hours and he burnt more calories on the day that he was cooking in the kitchen than on the day that we went for a two hour run. And it like he was wearing a device on the time, at the time. So it made him understand that his lifestyle is actually like contributing to the amount of calories that he's burning. And he really needs to get that because he's done a six to eight hour day on his feet in the kitchen. And then he comes home and thinks he's got to go for a two hour run to get the calorie burn like to that particular point. But because he was wearing the device, he was like, no, nah, he understood. Oh, this is actually like, this is what's burning. You know, my overall day is what's actually burning my calories as opposed, as opposed to a specific, um, you know, two hour period in which you're exercising. If you go for a 20 minute run, the amount of calories that you're gonna burn during that time wouldn't be more than about 200. And if you just sat still, you'd probably still burn at a rate of probably 40 calories. So you've gotta know that you're burning um, while you're sleeping. So, so like you've gotta have these measurements in place and it's just to get an understanding. Oh, this is the amount that I'm burning. This is the amount that I need to consume. And this is the balance that I need to create to maintain my weight. If I want to lose it, I need to get a little bit less. And so I'm not saying that you need to go out and measure every gram of your food. You just need to understand the concept so you can start to ballpark. it. So what happens is you go out and have a salad, but you put like it's 300 calories and then you put your sauce on and it's now 600 calories. It's just understanding the energy value so you can make the decisions that are actually going to be beneficial for you. Um, I think that we're supposed to be wrapping up in about a minute. Um, so I, I do want to open it if there's any more questions or anything that people want to ask at this particular point, I probably have the chance to answer to one. Um, otherwise we'll probably need to, to wrap it up. I'd love to have more time to speak to you guys. Um, you know, just in terms of like giving you a bit more specifics so you can actually be fully set up so you can take on another program, but I hope that you got the concepts. Um, so you understand measuring systems, so, so important. Please make sure you have measuring systems in place. We want to look in the mirror and go, yeah, look, we, we know we're getting results, but you want to know exactly what the results are. So, um, so there's a question saying, what do you recommend as far as food intake is concerned? Uh, and and uh, like, there's a couple of things. So food intake in terms of the calorie value will depend on how many calories you're burning. So you'll need to have a device to understand how many calories you're burning. I have people that are burning 1500 calories and people that are burning three and a half thousand calories. So I couldn't say that the food intake would be the same for them. Um, if they want to be in a deficit, it needs to be five to 800, maybe a thousand calories less. Um, you'll find if it's a thousand calories less than what you're burning, it's going to be too much. You'll feel too hungry and it's not going to be sustainable. The other thing with that is when you do go into a deficit, make sure every three to four days you come back up. So when you come back up, you, it means you're eating as much as you're burning. It just brings your body back into giving it more nutrients and it resets its system, its metabolism. Um, so food intake is gonna really depend on the amount of calories that you consume. Please get a device to know like what it is that you're burning. As far as like a diet is concerned, I am all about making sure you eat carbs, proteins and fats. Do not eradicate any of them. They are all important within your system. Um, we have another question that says, with exercise, it sounds like it's about consistency. How many minutes should be dedicated to muscle training versus cardio? Good, excellent question. Yes, it is about consistency. Absolutely. Consistency is going to be number one. Whatever time is going to keep you consistent, that's what you need to dedicate it towards. If you want to set the ideal amount, 20 minutes for cardio, 20 minutes for resistance training. That is like the ideal amount to continue on a program that's going to give you fantastic results. 
then you can fluctuate from that point. I normally spend around half an hour on each, 25 minutes to half an hour in resistance training, only because I'm doing one body part a day. Then I do 30 minutes of cardio. Um, yeah, that's, I think that we're, we're actually gone. How are we doing, Latrice? Are you there? We're doing good, but I think we should start wrapping it up. We might need to do a session number two. <laughs> yeah, there's so much more information. And, and now that like the people have actually sort of got these concepts in place, I want you to be able to utilize these concepts to develop a program. Um, I'd love to be able to set that up in some way so we can, like you can actually start. I want you to start today. So here's what I'll give you to start today. These are the two things that I would focus on first and foremost is your sleep. Have a look at your sleep. So that means you've got to see anything that's going to affect your sleep. If you're taking a considerable amount of caffeine, then that's going to affect your sleep. So have a look at all the factors that are affecting your sleep because sleep is going to be the number one thing as far as your recovery is concerned. Unless you're getting a good solid sleep, your exercise program is going to be gone. The other thing is water. Um, so what I want you to do is jump on the scale, have a look at your body weight. If you weigh 150 pounds, halve that amount. We go to 75. That's how many ounces of water I want you drinking a day. Do that every day. Just try those two things. Look at your sleep. Look at all the factors that are affecting your sleep. Try to maximize your sleep as much as possible and go to water. Just implement that one thing. I promise you, if you're drinking enough water, it will change everything for you. There's times where we start to consume food because we are dehydrated. That is one of the ways in which we actually get food, um, fluid, water is through food. So make sure that you're getting enough water first and foremost. So remember, jump on the scale. If you weigh 200 pounds, halve that amount, 100. And that's how many ounces of water that I want you drinking. Do that every day. See the difference that it makes. So that is the first thing, the steps that you can take into place. And then you can start to build. Hopefully you have enough concepts. Um, look at the energy, like the measurement systems, go back through what I've said and have a look at what measurement systems that you can actually implement. 